All right. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, uh, David. And it's uh, wonderful to be here at, to see such a good turnout for uh, the preventive session. It uh, really does warm our hearts. I am going to talk about genetics, and my goal here is that not to intimidate you in any way. Uh, uh, it's to make things simple and tell some stories and uh, and see if any of it resonates with you. I, I, I do, uh, I wor work uh, with a charity and a, as a volunteer, I'm the chief medical advisor for a charity uh, for FH, that's my disclosure. And um, obviously the reason that we're here is that cardiovascular disease, heart disease, is the leading cause of death around the world. And it has been for, for many, many years. Number one in 1990, number one in 2013. There have been some changes. If you look over here, measles is, it used to be a very, very common cause of death. And now it's uh, moved down in the rankings and that's gained a lot of uh, notoriety lately. Obviously, cardiovascular disease is this green, is this light green here, this, this light green. And as we all get older, this is age heart disease becomes a bigger risk factor. And so by the time we're sort of social security age, it's, it's the leading, leading cause of death. And so what I wanted to talk to you today is how new technologies and new knowledge that we are learning from the genetic revolution may impact this uh, going forward. And I'm gonna tell you a few short vignettes, short stories, not go into great depth about uh, the science, about several ways that, that genetics is helping. One is, discovery, how, how we discover the genes uh, that are leading to heart disease, how, we, how that translates into a better understanding of heart disease for researchers and physicians, how that can lead to smarter and cheaper drug discovery. Um, there's some very good examples of that. How it can improve risk prediction, taking an individual person and trying to figure out whether they're gonna have a heart disease. Um, and maybe even in personalized therapy, changing what drugs are recommended for you based on your genetic background. And finally, improving public health. And this is something that many of you probably haven't thought about, but I've been thinking a lot about. Now, the, the next slide, this is all you need to know about genetics for this talk. Genetics is not rocket science. It's not even brain surgery. It, it's, uh, it, this, is, this is what we have here. This is the, each of these books. This represents the genome, three billion base pairs. That's a lot of base pairs. Remember, this is just the alphabet. This is the book of life, A's, T's, G's, and C's strung together uh, in uh, chromosomes. So we have 46 chromosomes. The DNA, three billion base pairs, is aligned on these 46 chromosomes. And part of these chromosomes are genes. Not all of the, chrom not, not all of the DNA are genes. About, we have about 20,000 genes, and that's only about 1% of the total sequence. Now. The rest of the DNA is doing important things, but it's beyond this lecture to talk a lot about that. What I'm mostly gonna be talking about is, is the genes that we know. And, and, and this is really something that's, um, we, we, we're in the beginning of the genetic revolution. I mean, it was only in the year around 2000 when we first mapped the human genome. This was a, uh, uh, you guys funded this through your taxpayer dollars. It cost $300 million back in the, in the 90s to sequence the first human genome. And not only do we have a map, but we know now a lot about what makes us all the same, similar to one another and what makes us all different. And I know that you all are not going to, who, who recognizes this guy? Anybody? Come on, I, I, people raise their hands, please. Okay, all right. This is, this is Sherlock Holmes, this is, and, and I'm, 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 you're not gonna remember everything I, I say, but I do want you to try to put a few things in your, in your mind palace. And so try to remember one or two things, and I think you'll, you'll get a lot out of this talk. So, uh, understanding genetics. And there's really two flavors of genetic conditions, and they're, and they're both uh, very important. And it all depends on how big the needle is in the haystack that you're looking at. <laughs> so some needles, some genetic diseases, are, are, are some, some conditions are really caused by single gene defects with very large effects. In this case, the, the, the genetic background really overwhelms the environmental impact. It plays a, a somewhat bigger role than in, in the environment. But most, and this, this is, I'll give you some examples of, of this kind of genetic condition, but most of heart disease is not caused by one single gene with a really large effect. It's caused by small changes, and so you're hunting for the needle in this haystack, small changes in many, many genes working together to lead to an increased risk. And so I'm gonna give you some examples of both of these and how they are, are, are different and the, and, and, and the same. And so the, the one that's most close to me is, is called familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, 
I know that how many of you knew about Benedict Cumberbatch? How many of you know what familial hypercholesterolemia is? Raise your hand. So very, very few. More, more people know about Benedict than, than know about FH. But at the end of this talk, more people are going to know about FH than Benedict. So uh, this is a disease where the genetic effect is very, very large. And where one misspelling, I told you about the, the, the uh, language of, of life, the DNA language of life, one misspelling in those three billion base pairs can turn a clean coronary artery, no disease, into a very diseased coronary artery. And for, for FH, the use of genetics, the time is now. You know, the time is now. We should be doing a, a lot about this. Now, many of you, how many of you heard of cystic fibrosis? Okay, everybody in the room. Marfan syndrome. How many of you heard of that? Okay, good. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the killer of young athletes. How many of you heard of that? Many, many of you. Ha but, but very, very few have heard of FH. And that's a real shame because FH is way more common than any of these other conditions. It causes a 20-fold lifetime increased risk of heart disease. If you're a man and you have FH and you're not treated, there's a 50% chance you'll have a heart attack by age 50. And if you're a woman, there's a 30% chance by age 60. It costs hundreds of million dollars to our healthcare system every year, and yet we don't, we don't know about it. And we estimate that in the United States, there are about a million people with FH. Less than 1% know they have it. And that means it's important because if they don't know they have it, then their kids don't know that they're at risk, et cetera. And that's the bad news. The good news is that if we did know about everybody that have FH and we treated them appropriately, then we could make their uh, risk of heart disease approach that of the general population. So just with very simple treatments, uh, medications to lower cholesterol, we can make an FH patient's risk disappear. And that's shown here. So people that had FH, uh, with drug treatment, their morbidity and mortality is that of the general population. If you don't have FH, if you, if you have FH and you're not on treatment, then the chances that you die early are very, very strong. Now, in the United States, we haven't done a good job of doing this, but in the Netherlands and other countries, we're trying to change this, they take a different approach, and they use genetics in a very sophisticated way. They, they say if they find one patient with FH, they send a nurse to all their relatives they, they take a DNA sample from the first patient, and if they find the genetic mutation that causes that FH, they screen all of their relatives for that mutation. And in that way, they started with 5,000 patients, and they identified 60,000 family members that did not know they had FH before. And it, cost, it was very cost-saving, very cost-effective. They saved lots and lots of lives. So this is an indication for where genetics can be used right now to improve our ability to diagnose a deadly condition and get people on the right therapy. So that's a, that the time is now for the use of genetics in, in FH. Now, uh, put, put FH in your mind palace. I want everybody here to leave, to leave the room knowing what FH is, genetic form of high cholesterol. Now, like I said, most of us don't have FH. You know, it affects about 1 in 250 probably people. Most of us have a predisposition to heart disease caused by small mutations working in concert together with our environment to lead to heart disease. And it's only in the last five or 10 years that we really have started to understand some of these risks. And it's really been caused by technological revolutions that allow us to survey the entire genome at a cost that's reasonable. And so uh, this all started, uh, you know, even though the genetic revolution has really started in the last uh, 10 years, the discovery of, of, of the genetic basis of common disease really can be traced back to the 1830s when Charles Darwin went on his famous voyage with the Beagle and, and really started to think about evolution. Now, this genetic revolution, uh, 10 years ago, if, if you had asked me, how many genes do you know that contribute to garden variety heart disease? And I would have said zero. And now that, that landscape has totally changed. And I, I'm going to show you a different plot. And this plot, it, 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 the most important thing to know is these are all the chromosomes, and each of these dots represents a, a, a genetic locus, a gene that's contributing to heart disease. So 10 years ago, none of this was known. Now there's at least 50 or 60 genes that we know contribute to heart disease. Yeah, we are learning. And this is, this is the money that you guys put into the uh, uh, Genome Project. Now some of these findings were completely unexpected. The, the top finding, we had no idea that this gene was, was going to contribute to heart disease. Other of these genes, LDL receptor, that makes a lot of sense. But So we're finding things that we, we thought we might find, but we're also finding things that were completely novel. I mean, who would have ever guessed, before this all started, uh, that the ABO blood group 
uh, whether you have A blood, B blood, or O blood, does slightly change your risk of heart disease because blood groups are broken down a little bit differently and liver can change your cholesterol levels. So the genetic revolution is leading to new discoveries, and some of these are translating into to new genes, and I'll talk about that in the, uh, next. One of these genes, um, this gene over here, PCSK9, is really the poster child for genetic medicine changing the way we think about developing pharmaceuticals. And that's, uh, that's epitomized by, by new drugs, and, and the PCSK9 story is very interesting. About simultaneously, people in France were discovered that had an overactive PCSK9. It's an enzyme in the blood. If you have overactive PCSK9, you have extremely elevated levels of cholesterol, you have FH, and you die of early heart disease. Simultaneously, people in Texas were found to have underactive PCSK9. And then people that had underactive PCSK9, they have very low cholesterol levels from birth, and they never get heart disease. So the risk of heart disease is almost nil in people that had a naturally occurring inactivating mutation in this gene. And so what did the pharmaceutical companies do? They said, well, this is amazing. I found a gene that causes, uh, if, I, if I inactivate it, causes almost no heart disease. And the way it does that is it, it lowers cholesterol. And so there's many pharmaceutical companies that are now developing drugs that will soon come on the market that lower cholesterol uh, by, by, activating, by, by inactivating this PCSK9. So this is a poster child for how the genetic revolution is changing the way we develop drugs and directly leading to therapies that will, will treat uh, many, many people in the room. Now, we know more than ever, but we're still at the tip of the iceberg. We, remember that when, when some, some people say, you know, the genetic revolution is, is not translated into enough yet, and I say, we've only been at this for 10 years, you know, give us some time, because it's, it's already translating into things that, that are important. Now, what, what else is the genetic revolution doing? Well, it's uh, helping us to avoid costly mistakes. And this is important. We have finite resources. And I'll give you uh, the poster child uh, explanation for that. So many of you have heard of HDL cholesterol. Who's heard of HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol? OK. We all know that many large scale studies have shown that having a high HDL is associated with a lower risk of heart disease. But being associated with a lower risk of heart disease is that because HDL causes a lower risk of heart disease, or just that the fact that having a high HDL is also associated with people that exercise more, eat a better diet, you know, et cetera, et cetera? Is it, is it really the HDL that we should be targeting? Should we be trying to raise HDL levels with drugs, or should we be trying to tell people to exercise more, to lose weight, to, to eat a better diet? And that is something that we never I knew the answer to until recently, until geno genetics and genomics have, have helped us with that. And uh, I'm going to tell you a, a little bit about why this is so important. So again, association does not equal causation. And I'll give you two examples for, for why this is a bugaboo for medicine. So it uh, turns out that, that um, reading a newspaper is associated with a very high risk of heart disease. And uh, why is that? Is that because you're reading a newspaper is causing your heart disease? You see some stressful news? No, it's because that people that tend to read newspapers are, they're sitters, but they're also older. So nowadays, people don't read newspapers. You know, your grandkids and your kids read, read uh, you know, blogs on th off, the, uh, off the internet. They don't read newspapers. So the only people that are reading newspapers tend to be older. And those people have a risk of heart attack. So association does not equal causation. If I, if I tell people not to read newspapers, it's not going to decrease the risk of heart attack. <laughs> now, the other example is, uh, is ice cream. So it turns out that I ice cream consumption is associated with risk of shark attacks. Now, does that mean I should tell people not to eat ice cream? No, because uh, it, uh, why is that? It's because people eat ice cream in the summer months, people swim in the summer months, and so these things are associated, but they're not cause, cause, causing things. So by, by telling people not to eat ice cream, I'm not going to reduce the risk of heart attacks. Now, it turns out that HDL is associated with heart disease, but is it causal? And it turns out that we can now use genetic information to figure that out. We can use genes. If HDL is, a, is causal for lower risk of heart disease, then gen genes that raise HDL should also be associated with a lower risk of heart disease. And it turns out that's not the case. So the, the HDL association with heart disease is not causal. It's, it's just telling us that people that have high HDL are the people that are exercising, 
that are eating a good diet, et cetera, et cetera. So, so basically what, what that tells drug companies is that you know, treating, giving people drugs that specifically raise HDL is probably not going to work. What we'd rather should be doing is telling people to exercise and eat a better diet. And that's been the case not only for HDL but for many other biomarkers. So causal biomarkers, LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, is definitely causal for heart disease. Lipoprotein little a, some of you have heard about that, that's definitely causal for heart disease. Blood pressure is definitely causal for heart disease, et cetera. And if Pfizer or uh, uh, these other companies had known about these type of studies 20 years ago, they might not have invested 800 million billions of dollars in, in, in creation of drugs to raise HDL levels. So the genetic revolution is changing the way that pharmaceutical companies spend their money. Okay, what about pharmacogenetics? So pharmacogenetics is the idea that I can take your genetic background and I can look at your genetic background and I can make intelligent treatment decisions about what medicines to put you on. Now, how does it work now? Now, this is the idea of personalized medicine. And now, now Norman Rockwell didn't conceptualize personalized medicine as being able to change your, your, your uh, treatments based on your genes. He said a personalized medicine is a doctor that goes to your house and listens to you and takes care of you. But nowadays, personalized medicine means something a little different. So how does it work now? Well, your doctor says, well, your cholesterol seems to be a bit, a bit high. And the patient says, well, what do you think I should do? Well, you should take this medicine. And then it, the patient comes back later and says, well, you know, I got these muscle aches. Oh, well, you know, that's too bad. Let's try this other medication. Well, I, oh, that's a little bit better. Well, let's try this other medication. So it's this, it's this idea that it's this um, iterative process that, that can take a long time. And, you know, it turns out that we might we're not at the point yet where we're use, using this routinely. We, we might get there in the near future. And now, who, who knows who these guys are? Watson yes, Watson and Crick. And, you know, so the, the DNA molecule, remember, the DNA molecule was only discovered and, I mean, uh, really uh, conceptualized and really figured out how it worked in the 50s. So, you know, it's not that long ago. And you can actually see this model in London. They still have this model. It's, it's unbelievable to see it. So how, how is this going to help us you know, for preventing heart disease? Well, it turns out that statins, I mean, there's a lot of people that are taking statins and many millions of people in the country. They're the most prescribed drugs besides narcotics in the world. So amongst the top 10 medications that are prescribed in the world, uh, Lipitor, Zocor, Lip uh, Torvastatin, Simvastatin, uh, Resuvastatin, all these are amongst the, 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 really the most prescribed drugs in the world. But, and they're really good, but who knows what the major side effect from taking a statin is? The major, the major adverse side effect is, 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 is muscle aches, but the major side effect from statins is actually living a long, longer life. <laughs> so, um, for, for people that need them. So, but 40% of patients uh, with an indication for a statin are not treated, and many of those are because they don't want to, people don't want to take them because they cause these adverse side effects like muscle aches. About 10 or 15% of patients have muscle aches. Now, it turns out that there are genetic variants that have been identified that predispose you to muscle aches, and they, they all involve how you, or your body handles the statin, how it recycles it, how it breaks it down. And some people with uh, mutations in some of these genes are more likely to develop muscle aches than others, and they're particularly more likely to develop with, with certain statins. There's about eight different statins, and some of them are more, more likely to cause muscle aches in people that have these, these conditions. So if you happen to know your genetic background for this gene, then there are recommendations now for what statin you should take. Now, we're not at the point where this is being widely implemented because we don't know the genetic background of most individuals, and we still need to do trials to show that it saves money and saves lives to do this kind of stuff, but this is uh, the way it might work in the future. Now, what about risk prediction? What, what if I knew your genetic background, you came to me and I said, how, how well can I predict your risk of having a heart attack or, or stroke or something like that? Currently, we, we base those recommendations. Many of you came around to the table and we gave you your, your risk estimate based on uh, a statistical model. And that was ba based on, on, on work that was done in, in many studies over the years, epidemiologic studies. The most widely known is Framingham. So who knows what Framingham was? Framingham was. Okay, so Framingham is a very interesting, very important study. Again, paid by taxpayer payer dollars. Started in the 50s and 60s and they went to this this town in, in Massachusetts called Framingham, and they basically recruited everybody to be a participant in this trial, and they measured everything they could measure, the cholesterol, the blood pressure, the heart disease. Remember, this is what, before we knew that cholesterol and blood pressure 
were risk factors for heart disease. And then they followed those people for many, many years, and they figured out what risk factors led to heart disease. And this is how we know, this is why we measure cholesterol, this is why we measure blood pressure, this is why we measure whether you have diabetes or not. And so we can build these statistical models based on, on our knowledge of Framingham. We can say, if we took 100 people just like you that had your blood pressure, your cholesterol, et cetera, what is your risk of heart disease? Now, that's, not, that's, not, that's telling you about your risk factors, but it's not telling you about your genetics. I would turn that on its head and say, if I happen to know your genetics, how well could I predict your risk? And it turns out that I can predict your risk just as well as Framingham but I can't predict it any better currently. And so are you a glass half full person saying, man, I'm, we're just at the tip of the genetic revolution and I can do just as well with 15 risk markers, 15 genetic lo lo loci than I could do with Framingham? Or are you a glass half empty person and say, well, Framingham is pretty cheap. You know, all I need to know is my blood pressure cholesterol. And so right now, uh, genetic risk score predicts risk just as well as traditional risk factors, but not better. So again, we're not quite at the point where we're using this routinely, but uh, in the next 10 years, maybe we will be. Okay, so those are a few vignettes. I'll just have a couple more. What about this? Can we improve health by giving people information about their genetic risk? And I love this slide. It says, motivation, some people need more than others. And here's this shark chasing this canoe, <laughs> right? So, so we know, uh, uh, Dr. Marin will talk about this. It's almost, it's very, very difficult to change behavior. I mean, you guys have all been to your doctor. They say, you know, lose weight, exercise, take your medicines, stuff like this. And how many of you truly, if you, if you really ask yourself, how many you take those recommendations? Not, not very many. And the, I, there is this idea that maybe people treat genetic information differently. Maybe they will pay more attention to genetic information than they would pay to other information. And that's the idea of, of, of genetic exclusivity. So uh, currently, the, none, none of the governing bodies recommend doing genetic testing for heart disease, again, because there's never been a trial that says, if I give people genetic information, it makes them more motivated to, to lose weight and exercise and, and improve their diet, et cetera. And, and we are at Stanford asking the question, what, is that really the case or not? And so we've, we've, we're in the middle of a trial where we're giving people information about their inherited risk of heart disease and we're seeing whether it alters their behavior. And we don't know. Uh, I think it's gonna be hard to show that people, people react differently, but, but we'll see. Now, uh, I don't want to give you guys the impression that um, genes are, are it. You know, we're all products of our genes and in our environment. And um, you know, uh, this is what this is the kind of thing that's happening in, in, in the world, the obesity epidemic. You know, and so, and, and David will talk a lot more about this this soon. But uh, it is true that 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 um, people that have a higher risk for for obesity, for instance, have should even even more so probably avoid sugar sweetened beverages. So this was a paper that came out. Uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it took people that had uh, a risk, a genetic risk, a genetic load that predisposed them to higher weight. And it divided the group, people into four groups, those at the highest genetic risk and those at the lowest genetic risk. Highest genetic risk, lowest genetic risk. And they asked, you know, how much soda they were drinking, basically. And it turned out that the people that had the highest genetic risk that drank soda gained more weight. Now, this is not a massive amount of weight. It's a few pounds. And so for each individual, this is not a huge effect, but if you took the whole population of the United States, that would be millions and millions and millions of pounds that were, were gained by people that were. Now, do I need genes to tell me that I shouldn't drink a lot of soda? No, but it just telling us that, and can I blame the obesity epidemic on genes? No, our genes are the same in the United States now in general as they were in the 1800s. That does not explain why the United States is getting uh, more and more overweight. But um, it, it, is a, it is a contributing factor. So, uh, so in, in general, we should take our genes, and we, we know that they're, they're playing an important role, but lifestyle is, is playing an ex even more important role. You can alter your genetic. None of these genes are, are really destiny, but you can alter your, your future based on, on your, your li diet and lifestyle. And, and David is going to talk a lot more about this, but the foundation of good health uh, remains exercise. So this is one of my favorite slides. Here's a, some people going to the gym, taking the escalator to the gym. <laughs> Obviously, that's a bad idea. We should be exercising more. We should be eating fruits and vegetables. We should not be smoking, etc. 
Now I'm going to get a little bit futuristic, even more futuristic, and, and look into the future for the last couple minutes, the last couple slides, and say, what does the future hold? And, uh, and I, I told you that the first human genome sequence uh, cost $300 million, and it took five years to do. And so I want to, I'm going to show you an example of uh, how cheap genotyping and, and genetic information is now relative to how you, it used to be. And so I'm just going to show you this example of a Ferrari spider. So uh, this is the cost of a Ferrari spider. And imagine the cost of the first human genome sequence was $300 million, and that's equivalent to $398,000. You can go down the street, El Camino Real, and uh, pl plop down your $398,000 and drive away with your, your Ferrari spider. Now, if the price of a Ferrari spider had dropped as precipitously as the price of genetic sequencing, how much would it cost, how much would a Ferrari cost nowadays? $100. $100. Anybody else? Two hundred. Ten dollars. Okay. It turns out that the cost of sequencing has dropped so precipitously that the new price, if the cost of the Ferrari had come down that quickly, would be forty cents. Whoa. So the cost of genetic sequencing is is unbelievably. You know, we can now sequence a whole genome from an individual in about a week for less than a few thousand dollars, less than five thousand dollars, certainly maybe $10,000. When you add in the cost of interpretation, it goes up. But, you know, $300 million to $10,000, that's a big drop. And so what if everybody's genome was available in their medical record? And uh, some of uh, my colleagues, and I had a various, you, you know I played a small role in this paper when, when my name is like down here, out of like 50, I'm like down here. This was led by one of our colleagues, Ewan Ashley. And uh, he was approached by one of our, our colleagues at Stanford who, who actually is an inventor. He invented his own technology to sequence, and he sequenced his own genome. And then he said, well, I'm not a doctor. What do I do with this? So he went to my friend Ewan, and he said, well, what do I do with this? And so they, Ewan got together. This whole team, you can imagine, it's, it's, this is a lot of people spending hundreds and hundreds of hours looking at this single genome. And, it, and they found out that here he is, and he had a family history of heart disease. And it, it, it turns out that he was at higher risk for heart disease, and he was at low risk of having uh, problems with uh, uh, cholesterol-lowering medications. He didn't have a, a very high risk of having problems. He had a high cholesterol, and so the recommendation was actually to change his therapy based on his genetic background. And uh, so we made him that recommendation based on this, and, and uh, five years later we asked, do you think he's taking his cholesterol-lowering medication? No. So, so, I mean, this is a, you know, we're, we're still, we're still have to prove that this information can be useful, but nevertheless, the, gen the genetic revolution is getting cheap enough that this could be envisioned. I mean, a CT scan, an echocardiogram, all of these things cost now a sort of equivalent to what a genome sequence cost. And so with great power comes great responsibility. So here's the three billion pieces, and, and here's the scientist saying, I think I found a corner piece. So how do you look, how do you look at three billion pieces? Uh, uh, six billion data points, three billion base pairs is six billion data points. And so we've also asked the question, well, what do you do if you take a bunch of healthy people and you look at their genomes? How many variants do you, do you need to look at and how long does it take? And it turns out that if you take uh, uh, individuals that are basically healthy and you sequence their entire genome, you find a hundred variants that you say, well, you know, really I need to look at those because those look kind of worrisome. But it's not that easy. To do that, it takes a, a person on an average about 60 minutes to look at each of these variants. So 60 times 100, I mean, uh, that's a lot of minutes. And then uh, we have to look at those variants, and, and in the end, it turned out that one to three of those uh, variants would lead to a new diagnostic test. So it's not all, uh, uh, you know, uh, strawberry and cream, strawberries and cream. You know, you have to think that there's going to be downstream of uh, costs associated with genome sequencing. Now, despite that. Um, we discovered that there were two to six personal uh, disease risk findings that were discovered, and one person had a, a very deleterious mutation in a breast cancer gene, uh, a la Angelina Jolie, that led to this woman um, being uh, screened much more rigorously with imaging at th and, and things than she was before. So that brings me back. Uh, remember your mind palace. Who was in your mind palace? Well, it was Sherlock Holmes, and so we now refer to you and uh, as the Sherlock Holmes of uh, of the genomes at, at Stanford. And so, 
um, the, and the last few slides are that, that this technology is now not being routinely used for the people sort of in this room, but we are using it routinely for people that are medical mysteries. These are people that have had a condition, they don't know what it is, they've been to 50 doctors, they've had every test that they can, um, and, they, and they, they still don't have an answer. And in those kind of situations, the use of these sequencing is leading to new diagnoses every, every day. And, and we're even occasionally using it in, in a pediatric intensive care unit. There's a case recently where a baby was born. This baby had a malignant arrhythmia. Uh, the sequencing was sent off. They found the genetic variant that was causing this, and they changed the therapy that the baby had based on this information. So the genetic revolution is here. It's altering um, our ability to do all kinds of things, and, and we, still have a, we still have a ways to go. So thank you so much. My name is David Marin. I'm Director of Preventive Cardiology at Stanford. And I'm going to talk about diet, cholesterol, and heart disease. Um, my disclosures are on this slide. I have some funding from the NIH, and I consult for a company called Beyond Meat. <laughs> so I'm going to review with you some evidence that links diet and heart disease and review with you what the current guidelines are from the government, from the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and if time permits, uh, make a few comments about making lifestyle change. So where, where do we get this idea that diet is connected to heart disease? And it, it comes from different lines of research. We know from some animal experiments. We know from uh, feeding people and studying the effects. And uh, some what are called cohort studies, like the Framingham Project that Josh mentioned. And we know uh, from clinical trials. So first, some animal studies. This over a century ago, some Russian scientists fed some rabbits high fat, high cholesterol diets, and then did autopsies on them. And, and uh, this picture is a color photograph. It's actually not from the 1909 publication, which had a drawing of the aortas. But these, these are from more recent studies that are very similar, a typical rabbit chow diet. And these are aortas showing uh, a lot of atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is that process where uh, cholesterol and inflammatory cells are uh, form deposits inside arteries and basically cause obstructions that lead to heart attacks and strokes, depending, of course, on which arteries are, uh, are getting clogged up. These uh, scientists over 100 years ago found that, okay, if they just feed cholesterol alone and take away the fat, that that also caused atherosclerosis in rabbits. Now, we don't do the same kind of experiments in people for some ethical reasons, um, but people have been fed high-fat, high-cholesterol diets, and we have studied the effect on their blood cholesterol. Hundreds of experiments have been done. And they show that when you feed saturated fat to people, their cholesterol goes up. And specifically, their LDL cholesterol goes up, low-density lipoprotein cholesterol. When you feed cholesterol to people, the cholesterol in the blood also goes up, but not nearly so much as when you feed saturated fat. Now, to make sure everybody's on the same page, I have uh, made some slides to help uh, remind everyone what foods have saturated fat in them. And sat they're called saturated because they don't have any double bonds. And we get saturated fat in meat, in dairy products, meaning butter and whole fat, um, dairy products, whole fat milk products, cream, cheese, and in tropical oils like coconut oil and palm oil. So red meat, 
cheese, whole fat dairy. And then we have polyunsaturated fats. Poly for multiple um, double bonds. And so sunflower oil, safflower oil, corn oil, soybean oil, liquid vegetable oil at uh, room temperature. Linoleic acid is the most common polyunsaturated fat that we eat. And then there are monounsaturated fats. And these are common in nuts, in olive oil, in canola oil, avocados. So that's where we get our monounsaturated fats. You've heard of hydrogenated oils. They can be completely or partially hydrogenated. This is by forcing hydrogen atoms onto vegetable fats, and they create trans fatty acids, which you can, it, it turns out it, it, it's really good for shelf life of, of foods, so it, it keeps them uh, kind of fresh and they stay on the shelf for a long time. Um, you can find them in popcorn and in donuts and all kinds of pastries, french fries, and uh, fortunately, they have been, th there are rules now against uh, trans fatty acids in certain industries, so they're disappearing from our, uh, our foods, but they're bad. Uh, so when you eat trans fatty acids, that r those raise your LDL cholesterol. And then of course there's cholesterol in the diet, not to be confused with cholesterol measured in the bloodstream, and foods that are high in cholesterol are egg yolks, and you get a lot of cholesterol in shellfish. So that's just a, a quick reminder of those foods that have saturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fat and cholesterol. Now, how much cholesterol is in an, just is an average avocado? None. Educated group, you're absolutely right. And the point is that plant foods don't have cholesterol. You get cholesterol only in animal products. Animal cells have cholesterol in their membranes. Plant cell walls, no cholesterol. So um, for those of you who may not see, a, a whole egg may have 550 milligrams of cholesterol, an egg white, zero cholesterol, um, cream cheese for a, a 100 gram portion, 120 milligrams, and, and so on. So this is a summary slide of hundreds of experiments showing that when you replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat, you lower cholesterol. And if you replace saturated fat with monounsaturated fat, you lower the cholesterol, but not quite as much. And when you eat less cholesterol, you lower the cholesterol level in the blood a little bit. And so there's really no debate. Saturated fat raises your cholesterol. And if you substitute polyunsaturated fat or monounsaturated fat when, with, you know, in foods that would take the place of high saturated fat foods, you lower your cholesterol. Now, based on the average age in the room, I'm guessing that you know who this man is in the wheelchair. That is Ike, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. The year was 1955. The event, Ike Eisenhower had a heart attack. He was six, 64 years old, he was put on a highly publicized low-fat diet. There were twice-a-day press conferences for weeks, and our nation became focused on diet and heart disease. And in that year, there was a guy named Ansel Keys. Those of you who have heard of the K ration, um, he, he was the K. 
that uh, developed that food ration for uh, U.S. soldiers. He made the observation, uh, he, did, he did a lot of those uh, food experiments showing that if you replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat, you lower cholesterol. He noticed in Europe after the war that rates of heart disease were going down because food, rich foods were not so available as they were in the United States and American businessmen were having high rates of heart disease and he proposed that there's a connection between what we eat and, and getting heart attacks. And he made this proposal at a World Health Organization meeting uh, in 1955 and got a lot of criticism. And that helped motivate him to perform something called the Seven Countries Study, which I'll mention in a moment. The guidelines from the, the US dietary guidelines from those days suggested that we should eat a food from the basic seven food groups. And those food groups uh, were uh, green and yellow vegetables, oranges and tomatoes, potatoes and other kinds of vegetables. And then there was a food group for dairy, for meat, and for breads. And then butter and, and uh, margarines had their own food group. Those were, those were the basic seven. And at that time, in around 1955, we ate a almost half of our calories in the form of fat. So 44% of our calories came from fat, 17% of our calories from saturated fat. That was our peak. The guidelines changed around the time that Ansel Keys made his proposal about the diet-heart connection. And the food groups were consolidated into four groups. We got the milk group, the meat group, the fruits and vegetables and the breads. And then in 1961, Ansel Keys published the Seven Countries Study. And the Seven Countries Study was a, it was, it was observation of almost 13,000 men who were apparently well when the study started from 16, places within seven countries. And he found basically that there was a, a good correlation between how much saturated fat on the x-axis was being eaten in a given country and how high their cholesterol was. So this is a pretty strong correlation or association. And he also showed that there was a pretty strong correlation between the, uh, I'm sorry, let's see. Uh, on this slide was the correlation between saturated fat and the cholesterol level. And on this slide, it shows the co correlation between the cholesterol level and the chance of dying from a heart attack. And it was a pretty strong connection. Uh, and so if A causes B, or A, a is associated with B and B is associated with C, then A is associated with C, meaning Diet leads to high cholesterol. High cholesterol is associated with dying from a heart attack. Ergo, eat a diet high in saturated fat, you have a high risk of having uh, a cardiac death. And so this really caught on, and the American Heart Association in that same year published its first set, its first scientific statement on diet and heart disease, and that really has permeated our lives, and that is you know, if you think cholesterol, eating cholesterol is bad or eating saturated fat is bad, it, it comes from the, these uh, guidelines that were published in 1961. And there's been a lot of debate ever since, a lot of studies. I'm going to show you a, a couple. 1970, here's a study looking at what is the impact of feeding a high fat, high cholesterol diet on the coronary arteries of monkeys. And is it possible to reverse bad effects? A lot of people ask us, is it possible to have regression? Can I remove deposits inside uh, the arteries once they've been established? So there were actually 40 monkeys in this study. 10 were a control group that got regular monkey chow. 
Um, 30 were fed a high fat, high cholesterol diet for a year and a half, and then 10 were sacrificed. They looked at their coronary arteries. 20 others continued on a very low fat, low cholesterol diet, or on a high polyunsaturated fat, low cholesterol diet. And, and here's what was found. In the, the monkeys that were sacrificed after 17 months, they had very narrowed, clogged up arteries. This is where the blood flows in the middle of the artery. It, um, yeah, these were arteries ready for, for bypass. The monkeys had um, some heart attacks. Um, they had really bad arteries. On the bottom two slides, you see what the arteries looked like for monkeys who were on the so-called regression diets. You'll notice that the diameter of the artery is actually much larger, and the passageway is much bigger. So there was presumably regression. Uh, presumably these arteries looked like these, uh, but then they had the, the months and months of the, the cholesterol-lowering diet. So pretty strong evidence that diet causes heart disease in non-human primates and that you can actually improve it with a better diet. Um, <laughs> Time Magazine, you may remember the cover in 1984. Um, this actually was after the, the first successful cholesterol-lowering drug study in, in people who had high cholesterol. They were uh, given drugs that we don't use that much anymore today. They're called bile acid binding resins. But the connection that the public made and that Time Magazine made was don't eat eggs and bacon because it raises your cholesterol and it'll cause heart attacks. So that year, the dietary guidelines changed. And they said, don't eat so much fat, don't eat so much cholesterol, particularly avoid saturated fat, and eat a lot more carbohydrate. And the American public got the message. <laughs> so uh, we, we ate in those years a lot less fat um, and and re we really dropped our total fat consumption, our saturated fat consumption, and we increased our carbohydrate content. And what happened is really a remarkable story. Look at the, um, the, the colored states. Um, this, this, the, the pale blue is less than 10% are obese. The darker blue, 10 to 14%. And the colors will change over the decades I'm going to show you now. This is what percent of our country, following a higher carbohydrate diet, became obese. And it is remarkable how obese our nation has become. This is not a genetic evolution. It is all environmental. Um, even in our uh, healthy state of California, this is 20 to 24 percent obese in uh, the year 2010. So we got the message to cut down on fat, increase carbohydrate. We ate a lot of simple carbohydrate, meaning refined and sweetened uh, foods. Bad. Um, Atlantic. Uh, Magazine, you may remember this cover, Thomas Moore, 1989. There's been a lot of controversy if the guidelines that we are given are right. And uh, there are people who have made a lot of money selling alternative uh, ideas. This uh, quote says, diet has hardly any effect on your cholesterol level. Not true. Uh, drugs that can lower it often have serious or fatal side effects. No. Uh, I mean, rare, rare, serious, not fatal side effects. There is no evidence at all that lowering your cholesterol will lengthen your life. Um, at the time, true for people without any history of heart disease, uh, no longer true. Uh, with the advent of statins and studies that have uh, shown long-term follow-up. So Time Magazine also changed its cover. Um, <laughs> this is uh, after a study from Harvard showing that one egg a day 
will not increase your risk of heart disease if you don't have diabetes. Um, that, that was true. For people with diabetes, uh, higher egg intake is actually was associated with uh, an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. And here's Time Magazine again last year, changing its story. Eat butter. Um, it's not really a faithful interpretation of the evidence. But the evidence is confusing enough, that, and, and there are enough people here in, in the room suggesting we need to try to understand better what is the truth, what, what is the evidence. So yeah, this is a summary slide for you. Um, replace saturated fat or replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat is good. Replacing it with monounsaturated fat is good. And replacing it with sweets is bad. I mean, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to really make it clear. Um, this, is, uh, this is a picture of the Mediterranean diet. And this is one of the dietary patterns that clearly is associated with better health. There's also another diet pattern that's similar. It's called DASH, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. They encourage uh, nuts, like the Mediterranean diet, uh, low-fat dairy products. These kinds of diets lower blood pressure, they lower cholesterol, and more, most importantly, they, they lower the risk of heart, atta heart attack and stroke. PrediMed was the name of a study in Spain using the Mediterranean diet in healthy people. And uh, they showed it, it's a little, it, the rate of heart attack and stroke in healthy people, meaning no history of heart attack and, and stroke, the rate is, is really small. And you need a, thousands and thousands of people to prove a benefit. But that's exactly what was done in the PrediMed study. This is a blow up showing the control diet versus a diet that's enriched with extra virgin olive oil or with nuts. The Mediterranean diet uh, beat the uh, usual diet. It helped prevent heart attack and stroke. In uh, a great study that was done in France, in Lyon, men who had a history of heart attacks were randomly assigned to the American Heart Association diet or Mediterranean diet. And they found that there was no difference in the cholesterol levels between the, uh, uh, in people who were taking the Heart Association diet versus the Mediterranean diet. No difference in the cholesterol levels, but there was a big difference in the risk of having another heart attack or uh, a stroke um, or dying. And so this is, you, you want to you be on, this, on the top here. This is, everybody's alive at the beginning of the study, and, <laughs> and the, the lower um, you go, the, the greater the event of having, in this case, cardiac death or a non-fatal heart attack. This is the American Heart Association diet, and this is the Mediterranean diet. So there's pretty good evidence that the Mediterranean diet is a healthy way to go. Uh, this is a summary slide showing, uh, again, uh, heart attack um, event rates. You, you want them to go down. And this is when you replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat. The rate of heart attack goes down. So the dietary guidelines say Eat a diet that has lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, seafood, legumes, nuts, and low and non-fat dairy products. You've probably heard all this. Um, we have dietary guidelines that were just released last week. There's a comment period before they become official. Uh, for I, I think we have three months to make comments. Yeah, I, I've scanned it. It's 570 pages, really dense science. It's really well written, and this is basically what they say, along with don't eat three S's. 
reduce your intake of saturated fat, sugar, and sodium. Um, I could think of some kind of slogan to keep it simple, but these things, uh, you know, there are going to be people who have covers of, on Atlantic Magazine or Time, but these things are very consistent and they have been over decades now. So what do you think of the top sources of saturated fat in our diet? Butter, beef. Butter, beef. Baked goods, fast foods. Okay, so you guys are right. Um, this is a little hard to see, but I'm gonna read the top five. Regular cheese, pizza, grain-based desserts, uh, also known as probably cake and cookies, um, dairy desserts, ice cream, and Chicken and chicken mixed dishes, also known as probably chicken tenders and fried chicken kind of thing in a fast food restaurant. Yeah, and it goes on with sausage, franks, burgers, etc. cetera. Um, the very brand new guidelines from the USDA have uh, something that is sort of surprising to many of you. And that is that cholesterol is no longer um, restricted from the, the, the guidelines say that uh, literally available evidence shows no appreciable relationship between consumption of dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol. Cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern for overconsumption. Um, I would say that's what the evidence shows. And so, um, you know, cholesterol is connected to saturated fat, but it can also be disconnected. For example, when you eat seafood, uh, crustaceans, shrimp, and lobster, you're getting very little fat when you eat those. It's mostly cholesterol, and it really doesn't have much effect on your serum, your, your blood cholesterol. Uh, it's harder to separate cholesterol from saturated fat in meat. For red meat, for example. So that's something new that you may have read about in the news, and that's what the evidence supports. Um, you know, I want to leave plenty of time for question and answer, so I'm, I'm going to stop here and um, say that, uh, and ask Josh to come up, and we will be happy to take questions from this, uh, from up here at the podium. I am, please, please remind people to write out their questions and to fill out evaluation cards. So uh, let's have a, a free for all and uh, we have mics on the chairs. Thank you very much. Okay, so while we're waiting for questions to make it up, does somebody want to stand and, yes? What about goat cheese? What about goat cheese? <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I don't know a lot about goat cheese. Um, the yeah, uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna turn to Josh, even though I, unless you you would like to uh, field that question, okay? Um, goats are are. I have a I have a good friend. I didn't put it on my disclosure slide. I have a good friend who has a goat farm, and I'm gonna have to ask him about that. I'm sorry because I I don't know if there's any particular benefit from goats as compared with, with cow milk cheese. So I would, I would go with moderation as a, a general rule, but I don't, I don't have a, a good answer. Josh, have you got a, a question there? Yeah. Uh, 
What about wine? Okay. So um, there's a lot of attention about red wine in particular, uh, which has something called resveratrol, which may have some uh, beneficial effects on the artery wall. That here's the thing about alcohol. If you drink moderately, you're at a lower risk of dying from heart disease than if you don't drink at all. That's study after study shows that drinking is healthy for your heart if you don't overdo it. Um, do, are there any special attributes from red wine as opposed to any other form of alcohol? Beer, hard spirits? N not in large studies. It just, if you drink one drink a day for a woman, not to exceed two drinks per day for a man, it, they're good outcomes. What about coffee? Good news for coffee drinkers. Um, the new guidelines actually say coffee's good for you. And specifically, it's good for your heart. So don't worry about doing, you know, if you're avoiding coffee because you think it's bad for your heart, don't worry about it. Um, the evidence is just the opposite. Now, if you drink a lot of coffee and you get a lot of caffeine and you have palpitations or it makes you jittery, then just use common sense and avoid. All right. Um, one of the questions is, is the size of the LDL particles an important test? And uh, this is a, a good question. So um, when we talk about LDL cholesterol, we're talking about the concentration of the LDL cholesterol in the blood. There are many ways of assessing how much cholesterol is in the blood. One is how many particles there are. One is what is the cholesterol concentration, uh, et cetera. And it turns out that at a very broad level, they give the exact same information. So have, if you have information about one of those tests, you have everything that you need to make a, a, an informed decision. And for historical reasons, um, going, we have much, much more information about cholesterol concentrations. And so that is the test that's favored. We, all the large epidemiologic studies were done with cholesterol concentration. So in general, that's the measure that's, that's favored. Um, if we were all starting from scratch and we had to do it all over again, an LDL particle number or particle size was the same cost and we had the same evidence, then that might be different, but in general, the additional information that you get from LDL particle number, particle sizes, is not useful. What about coconut milk? Yeah, you know, the, the story with coconuts is kind of interesting. It has made the list of uh, tropical oils, co coconut oil, uh, that is rich in saturated fat and, and worrisome. But it looks like coconut oil raises HDL, not LDL. And coconut milk may not be so bad for you after all. So. You, you know, uh, the more we learn, the more these rules from the past get obliterated. And so the latest on coconuts, it, not so bad. All right, all right, how about this three-part question? Vegetarian versus Ornish versus paleo diet. Do you want to take that? No, you're, 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 <laughs> you the diet. you're so good at the diet question. Okay. I'm, I'm handling them all to you. All right. Well. Whoever asked, um, if you don't mind, whoever asked about the paleo, could you give a quick description of what you are thinking when you say paleo? No grains? OK. Um, so a vegetarian diet can take many 
shapes. You, you, you've heard of lacto, ovo, vegetarian, or vegan. I mean, those are not synonyms. Vegan is pure vegetarian, no animal products at all, so no eggs, no dairy. Then there's lacto, vegetarian, which would be dairy plus vegetarian. And lacto ovo would have the egg. Um, a vegetarian diet can be extremely healthy if it includes a lot of whole grains, fruits, vegetables. It may be ideal, although it's, it doesn't have fish. And fish, twice a week, is associated with a reduced risk of dying from heart disease. Um, you can eat a vegetarian diet and be very unhealthy. It can be just, um, y you know, you can just eat muffins and white bread and uh, macaroni and cheese and have a really unhealthy diet. So it, it, it depends on how you define uh, if you're eating whole foods and they're plant-based, that's, that's really probably one of the best diets that you could eat. A paleo diet, you know, the average life expectancy in the Paleolithic era <laughs> was, you know, maybe 25 to 35 years. And people didn't get old enough to get heart disease. So I would say beware of eating a really high meat diet when we have so much evidence that it's bad for you and not a whole lot of evidence that it's, it's good for you. The, the, uh, the last thing I'll say about this is that when you compare an Atkins diet with, uh, let's say, a Mediterranean diet, for weight loss, they're, they're the same. In terms of the ability to lose weight, it, it boils down to how many calories you eat. This has been done. I had some slides on it that I didn't show this morning. So beware of the long-term metabolic effects of eating a, a very high-fat or high-protein diet. There, there is no long-term evidence that this is a, a healthy way to go. All right, I'm going to, to field these two, let you off the hook for a second. What about sugar, cane, sodas in moderation? So the sugar wars, there's lots of uh, press about uh, is high fructose corn syrup or pure cane sugar or, or whatever, is, is any of these preferred? And, and honestly, the, the, the evidence is that simple carbohydrates like sugars, high fructose corn syrup are handled by the body in essentially the same way. And uh, there's really no good evidence, no strong epidemiologic evidence that, that the type of sugar that you're eating actually matters. Um, so uh, it's more the amount of consumption of, of simple carbohydrates. Um, can you talk about blood types and heart disease? That's probably my fault. So it, it turns out that if you're born with a certain blood type, a versus B versus O, there are very, very, very tiny genetic effects on your risk of heart disease, mostly because the body recycles blood cells that, that are A versus B versus O slightly differently, and so the cholesterol levels in those individuals are slightly different. But there is no evidence that, for instance, changing your diet based on your blood group will have any impact on, on your risk of heart disease. Every, every, the recommendations for everybody remain the same no matter what type of, of, of um, blood group you have. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, calcium supplements. What about calcium supplements? That's one thing. Do you think? Uh, You want to take that? Uh, you, you, you can handle it if you want to. I don't. Okay. Um, what about pumpkin pie in moderation? So, yeah, the, again, these things come. These things come. 
we're, we're not up here to, to try to dissuade you from occasionally eating a piece of pumpkin pie, but remember that, that every choice that you make uh, has very small implications going forward. So, you know, pumpkin pie, if you put in uh, lots of uh, simple carbohydrates, like simple sugars and lots of uh, butter, then it's going to be sl slightly raise your cholesterol level, but uh, that might be outweighed by the, the, the good time that you have on Thanksgiving. I, I love pumpkin pie. In, in case anybody wants to, yeah. All right, um, I don't see it, but here's a question. Uh, what about fish oil supplements? I, I have a lot of patients who take omega-3 fatty acid supplements because they, just out of curiosity, how many of you actually, yeah, wow, a lot of you, okay. Why? <laughs> because you don't eat fish. It thins the blood. Because it thins the blood. Okay. So here's, here's what fish oil does. In high doses, it lowers blood triglycerides. That's for sure. And I, I have a fair number of testimonials that it helps with arthritis. Um, should people who don't eat fish, take fish oil supplements? I don't think we know the answer to that. I will say that there have been several studies in the last few years looking at fish oil supplements versus placebo and heart disease events, meaning heart attacks. No benefit. Really disappointing, but no benefit. So, you know, it, it's clearly helpful for people who have High triglycerides, meaning like triglyceride level over 500. Taking fish oil supplements in a high enough dose will lower triglycerides. What kind of dose? You need a high dose. Um, I mean at least 2,000 milligrams a day of EPA and or DHA. That will lower triglycerides. You take a, a single supplement, usually has maybe 350 milligrams of uh, EPA and DHA in it. So that segues into, there's so, several questions about triglycerides. What are the dangers of triglycerides and how do we control them? So triglycerides uh, are, um, are definitely, uh, we know, causal for heart disease now. So very elevated triglycerides. The normal level for triglycerides is less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. There are many reasons that triglycerides can become elevated. Some people have primary genetic forms of very high triglycerides. And in those type of people, fish oil or other supplements are usually needed. But most often, high triglycerides are an indication of um, an insulin resistance or sort of pre-diabetic state. And in those, pay, in those individuals, the most important things that you can do to lower triglycerides are things like exercise more, you know, 45 minutes a day, five or six days a week, lose moderate amounts of weight, even five to 10 pounds can have dramatic effects on triglyceride levels decreasing simple sugar intake, decreasing alcohol intake, all of those things can lower triglycerides, and it is going to be important. Um, medications to lower triglycerides have been a little bit disappointing, and they're really um, um, usually reserved when triglyceride levels are very elevated as a primary form of therapy. So it's not until triglycerides are over 500 that we would um, usually consider medications to primarily for, for triglyceride lowering. So it's, it's mostly diet and lifestyle. Oh, what do you really think of statins? Okay, so this is always a question. You know, I don't get any money from statin companies. All statins are generic now. Essentially, all statins except rosuvastatin or Crestor are generic. So the drug companies are really not making a lot of money on statins. Statins are based on naturally occurring mold products that were discovered in Japan many years ago. They unquestionably cause muscle aches in a small percentage of people, like 10% to 15% of people. But they also unquestionably lower LDL and lower heart disease risk. They are a godsend for people that have genetic forms of heart disease like FH. And in the very, very large unbiased trials have clearly decreased risk. Now, the decreased risk from statins is also, core, uh, is, is also re related to how high the risk was to begin with. So the higher the risk 
is to begin with, the better the benefit of statins. So if you've already had a heart attack or you already have diabetes or you already have cholesterol that's through the roof, then, then statins are extremely beneficial. If you are low cholesterol, low risk, then, then they're probably of less benefit. Um, the, the, uh, one of the things that I talked about earlier was, 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 is LDL really causal for heart disease? You know, I think some of you have probably seen, you know, certain uh, celebrity doctors hosting programs on, on TV where they say, you know, LDL is, is not causal for heart disease, and I think that's clearly false. Uh, and, and statins are probably the most effective way of, of decreasing that risk. What about juice, juice, juice products? What about juice? Um, well, fruits and vegetables should be part of every healthy diet. Um, is it possible to overdo it? Probably. Um, I don't know if part of that question had to do with Oh, can you replace wine with grape juice? Um, that's a good question. You know, with grape juice, you can have the same antiplatelet effects. Platelets. Platelets are the things that make your blood stick. And aspirin is an antiplatelet. Uh, one of the things that you get from wine, from grape skin, is uh, an antiplatelet effect. You can get the same thing from grape juice. But obviously, you don't get quite the same thing with uh, because there's no alcohol. Um, I don't know if that was really what yeah. the yeah. what the question was yeah. about. Yeah. They're not the same, but they're similar. All right, I'm going to handle. Uh, Is there a yes. Okay. Okay, an issue for people who do not drink alcohol and for children who might want to have the benefit that alcohol can, can uh, okay. So um, I, what's that? I don't, I don't think the evidence is, is, no. is there to, to say that you can replace that. Yeah, it, juice, it, it just isn't the same. I mean, or grapes. But there, there's a little overlap when it comes to grapes and, and wine. There's a little overlap, but, but it's not much. And the one I know about is the effect on platelets that's beneficial. All right, uh, I'm gonna handle two more questions about statins, and then I'm gonna throw it to David for oat bran and flaxseed. So uh, what about CoQ10 for pre preventing side effects from statins? And, uh, and, and this is something pe people often do, and uh, it, it's one of those things where we don't have good evidence one way or the other. The large trials of, of supplementing people with CoQ10 to prevent side effects from statins have not shown benefit. Does that mean that they don't have benefit in an individual patient? No, um, but there's no large scale evidence to support them one way or the other. Um, do, what are the other side effects from statins? Uh, do statins cause dementia? Do they cause diabetes? And, uh, and, and the recent evidence does support that uh, uh, statins cause a slightly increased risk of diabetes. Um, that risk is greatly outweighed by the benefits of, uh, in, in people that really need to take them by a decreased risk of heart disease, but they do have a slight increased risk of diabetes, especially in those that were near diabetic to begin with. Do statins cause dementia? Uh, these studies have, are much more conclusive in that in, in large scale trials, there, there's no evidence that they caused increased risk of dementia. Some people say that in an individual basis, they impair their memory, but that, that again, in very large-scale trials has not been borne out. If anything, they reduce the risk of cerebral vascular disease and stroke, and stroke is a major cause of dementia. So uh, again, the balance of the evidence supports that they decrease the risk of, of dementia through decreasing stroke, and that they have a slightly increased risk of, of diabetes. And stay tuned because the NIH is funding a study looking at the effect of statins on uh, cognitive function. Um, given the change in uh, the ranking of shellfish and cholesterol with the new guidelines, is the following a great, good, or poor meal in the Mediterranean diet spectrum? And I think this says uh, hardened wheat or it's wheat pasta. Oh, oh, Durham wheat. Durham wheat. <laughs> Josh is from North Carolina. Durham wheat, <laughs> pasta, shrimp, and olive oil. 
Um, you know, I think that that's a, a, a good Mediterranean uh, meal. Uh, if you have to watch your carbohydrate intake because of diabetes, then you should moderate the amount of, of carbohydrate or the dose of insulin. But uh, whole grain, pasta, shrimp, and olive oil, great. Is oat bran or flaxseed helpful to lower cholesterol? Oat bran, yes. Um, how much? A little, depending on how much you eat. But oat bran, uh, as a water-soluble fiber, will lower LDL cholesterol a little. We're talking about if you eat a cup a day, it'll lower your LDL cholesterol maybe by uh, 5%. So uh, a statin at a good dose will lower it in the 30 to 50% range. Does flaxseed lower cholesterol? Not to my knowledge. Flaxseed will, is, is a precursor to some long chain fatty acids called omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, so you can get omega-3 fatty acids from eating a lot of flaxseed, but not so much cholesterol lowering. All right, I think we'll have time for uh, two more questions. We won't have time for everything, okay? Um, people, if, if they cannot take a statin because they have muscle aches, are there alternatives like Zetia or Zetamib? It turns out there are, and uh, the original cholesterol-lowering medications were bile acid binding resins, and those are still available, uh, and they lower cholesterol about 10 or 15%. Again, statins lower cholesterol 30 to 50%. Azetamib is another drug. It's also known as Zetia. It also lowers cholesterol by 10 or 15%. And there was a, a very important uh, recent trial of about 15,000 people that they followed for about 10 years that was published a, a few months ago. And it showed that not only does it lower uh, uh, cholesterol levels, but it also reduces the risk of heart attacks and strokes. And so in people that can't take statins, it is an alternative, but it's not quite as effective. Um, what about calcification of blood vessels? So the thing about uh, uh, the atherosclerosis, which is this process by which the blood vessels become full of, of cholesterol and uh, inflammatory molecules, it proceeds in the same progression in every individual. We, we known from autopsy studies, from army pe people that have died in, in the army in, in their 20s and 30s and 40s. We know from uh, autopsy studies of trauma victims that we all have Heart, the start of atherosclerosis is starting in all of us in our 20s and 30s. And in some people, that progresses much more rapidly than others, and we don't exactly understand all the ways. The end stage, the, 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 in the last stage of, of, of atherosclerosis development, the plaques actually become calcified. So if we find that there are calcified plaques in an individual, it means those plaques have been around for long enough that they've become calcified, and it also tells us that there are probably other um, plaques in there that are, are around that are not being calcified. So it's a marker, a burden of disease. Certainly, if we know about calcified plaques, we want to treat patients aggressively for that. Um, I, I would mention that there is a way to find out if you have calcium in your coronary arteries. It's uh, not covered by insurance generally. It's called a coronary artery calcium scan. It's a CT scan. Uh, you can get it at all the healthcare facilities in the area. And it will tell you if you have calcium in your coronary arteries or not. If you do have calcium, you have some amount of atherosclerosis. And that might make the difference between deciding to go on a statin or not go on a statin or to take aspirin or not take aspirin. I think that our time is up. We, we do have a few more questions, but uh, I don't think we'll be able to answer all of them. Well, we'll stay around for a little bit. Thank you all very much for coming. Yeah.